Barossus, B.R. says, or Barossus was a Hellenistic era Babylonian writer, a priest of Bel Marduk, an astronomer who wrote in the coin Greek language, and who was active at the beginning of the 3rd century BC. Versions of two excerpts of his writings survive, at several removes from the original, life and work. Using ancient Babylonian records and texts that are lost to us, Barossus published the Babyloniaca in three books sometime around 290-278 BC, by the patronage of the Macedonian Seleucid king Antiochus I Sota. Certain astrological fragments recorded by Pliny the Elder, Censorinus, Flavius Josephus, and Marcus Vitruvius Pollio are also attributed to Barossus, but are of unknown provenance, or indeed are uncertain as to where they might fit into his history. Vitruvius credits him with the invention of the semicircular sundial hollowed out of a cubical block. A statue of him was erected in Athens, perhaps attesting to his fame and scholarship as historian and astronomer-astrologer. A separate work, Procreatia, is attributed to him by the Latin commentaries on Aratus, Commentariorium in Aratum Reliquiae, but there is no proof of this connection. However, a direct citation is rare in antiquity, and it may have referred to Book I of his history. He was born during or before Alexander the Great's reign over Babylon, with the earliest date suggested as 340 BC. According to Vitruvius's work De Architectura, he relocated eventually to the island of Kos off the coast of Asia Minor and established a school of astrology there by the patronage of the king of Egypt. However, scholars have questioned whether it would have been possible to work under the Seleucids and then relocate to a region experiencing Ptolemaic control. Late in life, it is not known when he died. History of Babylonia Versions at several removes of the remains of Barossus lost Babylonia Cara given by two later Greek epitomes that were used by the Christian, Eusebius of Caesarea for his chronological canons the Greek manuscripts of which have been lost, but which can be largely recovered by the Latin translation and continuation of de Rome and a surviving Armenian translation. The reasons why Barossus wrote the history have not survived, though contemporaneous Greek historians generally did give reasons for the publication of their own histories. It is suggested that it was commissioned by Antiochus I, perhaps desiring a history of one of his newly acquired lands, or by the great temple priests, seeking justification for the worship of Marduk in Seleucid lands. Pure history writing for Shea was not a Babylonian concern, and Josephus testifies to Barossus' reputation as an astrologer. The excerpts quoted recount mythology and history that relate to Old Testament concerns. As historian and archaeologist W.G. Lambert observes, of course Barossus may have written other works which are not quoted by Josephus and Eusebius because they lacked any biblical interest. Lambert finds some statements in the Latin writers so clearly erroneous that it renders doubtful whether the writers had first-hand knowledge of Barossus a text. Transmission and reception Barossus a work was not popular during the Hellenistic period. The usual account of Mesopotamian history was CTEC as of Stedius's Persica. While most of the value of Barossus was considered to be his astrological writings, most pagan writers probably never read the history directly, and seem to have been dependent on Posidonius of Apamea, who cited Barossos in his works. While Poseidonius's accounts have not survived, the writings of these tertiary sources do. Vitruvius Pollio, Pliny the Elder, and Seneca the Younger. Seven later pagan writers probably transmitted Barossus via Poseidonius through an additional intermediary. They were Aetius, Cleomedes, Pausanias, Athenaeus, Sensorinus, and an anonymous Latin commentator on the Greek poem Phenomena by Aratus of Sola. Jewish and Christian references to Barossus probably had a different source, either Alexander Polyhistor or Juba II of Mauritania. Polyhistor's numerous works included a history of Assyria and Babylonia, while Juba wrote on the Assyrians. 
both using Barossus as their primary sources. Josephus' records of Barossus include some of the only extant narrative material, but he is probably dependent on Alexander Polyhistor, even if he did give the impression that he had direct access to Barossus. The fragments of the Babylonaica found in three Christian writers' works are probably dependent on Alexander or Juba. They are Tatianus of Syria, Theophilus Bishop of Antioch, and Titus Flavius Clemens. Like Poseidonius, neither Alexander's nor Juba's works have survived. However, their material on Barossus was recorded by Abidonus and Sextus Julius Africanus. The Greek text of the Chronicon is also now lost to us but there is an ancient Armenian translation of it, and portions are quoted in Georgius Sincellus's Ecloga Chronographica. Nothing of Barossus survives in Jerome's Latin translation of Eusebius. Eusebius or other mentions of Barossus in Pra Reparatia Evangelica are derived from Josephus, Tatianus, and another inconsequential source. Christian writers after Eusebius are probably reliant on him, but include Pseudo-Justinus, Hesychius of Alexandria, Agathias, Moses of Corinne, an unknown geographer of unknown date, and the Suda. Thus, what little of Barossus remains is very fragmentary and indirect. The most direct source of material on Barossus is Josephus, received from Alexander Polyhistor. Most of the names in his king lists and most of the potential narrative content have been lost or completely mangled as a result. Only Eusebius and Josephus preserve narrative material, and both had agendas. Eusebius was looking to construct a consistent chronology across different cultures, non-primary source needed, while Josephus was attempting to refute the charges that there was a civilization older than that of the Jews. However, the ten antediluvian kings were preserved by Christian apologists interested in how the long lifespans of the kings were similar to the long lifespans of the antediluvian ancestors in the story of Genesis. Sources and content The Armenian translations of Eusebius and Sincellus are transmissions both record Barossus a use of public records, and it is possible that Barossus catalogued his sources. This did not make him reliable, only that he was careful with the sources and his access to priestly and sacred records allowed him to do what other Babylonians could not. What we have of ancient Mesopotamian myth is somewhat comparable with Barossus, though the exact integrity with which he transmitted his sources is unknown because much of the literature of Mesopotamia has not survived. What is clear is that the form of writing he used was dissimilar to actual Babylonian literature, writing as he did in Greek. Book 1 fragments are preserved in Eusebius and Sincellus above, and describe the Babylonian creation account and establishment of order, including the defeat of Thalath by Bel. According to him, all knowledge was revealed to humans by the sea monster Oannes after the creation, and so Verbrugger and Wickersham have suggested that this is where the astrological fragments discussed above would fit, if at all. Book 2 describes the history of the Babylonian kings from creation till Nabonasaurus. Eusebius reports that Apollodorus reports that Barossus recounts 432,000 years from the first king, Aloris, to Zizalthros and the Babylonian flood. From Barossus' a genealogy, it is clear he had access to king lists in compiling this section of history, particularly in the kings before the flood, and from the 7th century BC with Sennacherimos. His account of the flood is extremely similar to versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh that we have presently. However, in Gilgamesh, the main protagonist is Utnapishtim, while for Barossus, Zizauthros is probably a Greek transliteration of Zeusudra, the protagonist of the Sumerian version of the flood. Perhaps what Barossus omits to mention is also noteworthy. Much information on Sargon would have been available during his time, but these were not mentioned. Similarly, the great Babylonian king Hammurabi merits only passing mention. He did, however, mention that the queen Semiramis was a Syrian. Perhaps it was in response to Greek writers mythologizing her to the point where she was described as the founder of Babylon. 
daughter of the Syrian goddess Derketa, and married to Ninus. Book 3 relates the history of Babylon from Nabonassaris to Antiochus I. Again, it is likely that he used king lists, though it is not known which ones he used. The Mesopotamian documents known as King List A and Chronicle are usually suggested as the ones he used, due to the synchronicity between those and his history. A large part of his history around the time of Nabucodonosoros and Nabondos survives. Here we see his interpretation of history for the first time, moralizing about the success and failure of kings based on their moral conduct. This is similar to another Babylonian history, Chronicle of Nabonidus, and differs from the rationalistic accounts of other Greek historians like Thucydides. The achievements of the history of Babylonia Barossus or achievement may be seen in terms of how he combined the Hellenistic methods of historiography and Mesopotamian accounts to form a unique composite. Like Herodotus and Thucydides, he probably autographed his work for the benefit of later writers. Certainly he furnished details of his own life within his histories, which contrasted with the Mesopotamian tradition of anonymous scribes. Elsewhere, he included a geographical description of Babylonia, similar to that found in Herodotus, and used Greek classifications. There is some evidence that he resisted adding information to his research, especially for the earlier periods with which he was not familiar. Only in Book 3 do we see his opinions begin to enter the picture. Secondly, he constructed a narrative from creation to his present, again similar to Herodotus or the Hebrew Bible. Within this construction, the sacred myths blended with history. Whether he shared Hellenistic skepticism about the existence of the gods and their tales is unknown, though it is likely he believed them more than the satirist Ovid. For example, the naturalistic attitude found in Sinchelusa transmission is probably more representative of the later Greek authors who transmitted the work than of Barossus himself. During his own time and later, however, the history of Babylonia was not distributed widely. Verbrugger and Wickersham argue that the lack of relation between the material in history and the Hellenistic world was not relevant, since Diodorus a equally bizarre book on Egyptian mythology was preserved. Instead, the reduced association between Mesopotamia and the Greco-Roman lands during Parthian rule was partially responsible. Secondly, his material did not include as much narrative, especially of periods with which he was not familiar. Even when potential sources for stories were available, they suggest, perhaps Berossos was a prisoner of his own methodology and purpose. He used ancient records that he refused to flesh out, and his account of more recent history, to judge by what remains, contained nothing more than a bare narrative. If Barossos believed in the continuity of history with patterns that repeated themselves, a bare narrative would suffice. Indeed, this was more than one would suspect a Babylonian would or could do. Those already steeped in Babylonian historical law would recognize the pattern and understand the interpretation of history Barossos was making. If this, indeed, is what Barossos presumed, he made a mistake that would cost him interested Greek readers who were accustomed to a much more varied and lively historical narrative where there could be no doubt who was an evil ruler and who was not. What is left of Barossus' writings is useless for the reconstruction of Mesopotamian history. Of greater interest to scholars is his historiography, using as it did both Greek and Mesopotamian methods. The affinities between it and Hesiod, Herodotus, Manathon, and the Hebrew Bible as histories of the ancient world give us an idea about how ancient people viewed their world. Each begins with a fantastic creation story, followed by a mythical ancestral period, and then finally accounts of recent kings who seem to be historical, with no demarcations in between. Blenkinsop notes. In composing his history, Barossus drew on the mythic historiographical tradition of Mesopotamia, and specifically on such well-known texts as the creation myth in Numa Elish, Atrasis, and the King Lists, which provided the point of departure and conceptual framework for a universal history.
but the mythic and archaic element was combined with the chronicles of rulers which can lay claim to being in some degree genuinely historical. This early approach to historiography, though preceded by Hejad, Herodotus, and the Hebrew Bible, demonstrates its own unique approach. Though one must be careful about how much can be described of the original work, his apparent resistance to adding to his sources is noteworthy as is the lack of moralizing he introduces to those materials he is not familiar with. Pseudo-Borossus. In 1498, Annius of Viterbo claimed to have discovered lost books of Barroso's. These were in fact an elaborate forgery. However, they greatly influenced Renaissance ways of thinking about population and migration. Because Annius provided a list of kings from Japhet onwards, filling a historical gap following the biblical account of the flood, Annius also introduced characters from classical sources into the biblical framework, publishing his account as Commentaria super opera diversorum auctorium ter antiquitati bis loquentium. One consequence was sophisticated theories about Celtic races with Druid priests in Western Europe.